Milk is a nutritionally complete food that contains almost everything that's needed for survival and growth. Whole milk contains six major components, vitamins, proteins, minerals, fats, sugars, and water. In terms of vitamins, there are two major types, water-soluble and fat-soluble. The water-soluble ones are pretty constant, but the level of fat-soluble vitamins depends on the fat content. When fat is removed from milk to produce things like skim milk, some of the fat-soluble vitamins are taken out with it. Because of this, vitamins like vitamin A and vitamin D are usually added after the fat is removed. There are many different proteins in milk, but the two main types are casein and whey. The proportion of each will vary depending on the milk source. For example, most of the protein in cow's milk is casein, but most of the protein in human milk is whey. I'm going to go into more detail about the proteins later in the video. Milk is a good source of minerals, and I've listed the major ones here. Many of them are present as salt compounds, for example calcium phosphate, which is a combination of calcium and phosphorus. A large portion of the minerals are associated with the casein proteins, and the rest are dissolved in the water. The fat in milk is a mixture of triglycerides. Triglycerides don't mix with water, and in milk, they're present as an extremely fine suspension of small droplets. If we take a look at the structure, we can see that it's a bunch of long molecules attached to a small backbone. The backbone is made from glycerin, and the tails come from a group of molecules known as fatty acids. A lot of fatty acids are quite stinky, but not when they're incorporated into a triglyceride. When milk goes bad, the triglycerides start to break down, which releases the stinky fatty acids. In terms of sugar, the main one is lactose. Lactose is known as a disaccharide because it's a combination of two smaller sugars, glucose and galactose. People who are lactose intolerant lack an enzyme called lactase, which normally breaks the bond between these two sugars. So for this video, I'm going to be separating some mi milk into the different components that I just mentioned. Milk is routinely processed into many different things like cheese and protein supplements, and I thought it might be interesting to show you guys where this comes from. So to separate the milk, I just need a few things. Sodium carbonate, acetic acid, and ethanol. The only component that I won't be separating out here is the fat, and that's because it's done using a centrifuge. I really don't have the proper setup to do that, so I'm starting with skim milk. If you decide to repeat the process that I'm doing here, it's really important that you use skim milk, because any fat will mess things up. A magnetic stir bar is added to a beaker, and I pour in about 200 milliliters of skim milk. I turn on the stirring and the heat, and then I add a thermometer. The goal now is to heat the milk to about 40 to 50 C, and to keep it there for 15 minutes. From this angle, it might be hard to tell, but it is in fact stirring. Anyway, after 15 minutes, the thermometer is removed, and I start to add acetic acid. The acetic acid is added in small portions, and I wait several seconds between each addition. After the second addition, a lot of solid stuff starts to form. This solid stuff is casein protein that's precipitating out of solution. In milk, casein exists as its calcium salt, called calcium caseinate. The structure of the salt is complex, and it's composed of three forms of casein, alpha, beta, and kappa. Together, they form a stable structure called a micelle. Part of the kappa casein has a lot of polar residues, which can favorably interact with water. So on its polar side, it interacts with water, and on its non-polar side, it's in contact with the alpha and beta caseins. Here's an artistic structure of the casein micelle. Each circle is a submicelle, which is a mixture of all three types of caseins. The outside layer is enriched with kappa caseins, and internally, the submicelles are held together by calcium phosphate interactions. The micelles are not technically dissolved in the milk, and they exist as a colloidal suspension. 
The stability of the micelle is heavily dependent on its interaction with calcium. The pH of milk is around 6.6, .6, and at this pH, the casein has a net negative charge that can interact with calcium. When acid is added, the net negative charge is neutralized and this interaction is lost. Because of this, the stable suspension of casein is compromised and it starts to aggregate. The same process occurs when milk starts to sour. Bacteria in the milk ferment lactose to lactic acid, which drops the pH and causes the casein to clot. This process of separating casein is how cheese and casein supplements are made. The characteristics of the cheese that is produced depends on many factors like the origin of the milk, its fat content, the bacteria that's used to ferment it, how long it's aged, etc. The last little bit of acetic acid is added, but it doesn't really do too much because at this point, pretty much all of the casein has already precipitated. I continue to stir things for a little bit and you can see that most of it has clumped up into this large ball. To separate it from the liquid, I filter it through a little bit of cotton. Once everything is filtered through, I wash the casein and the filter with a little bit of hot water. The funnel is then removed and the solution is placed back on the hot plate. The stir bar is removed from the beaker with the casein and it's quickly cleaned using a paper towel. For the time being, the casein is placed on the side and I cover the beaker with some plastic wrap. Okay, so at this point, I've separated off one thing, but I still have the albumin, the minerals, and the lactose to get out. In the next step, I need to heat things, but lactose is sensitive to hot acidic solutions. So before proceeding on, I need to neutralize any acetic acid that might remain, and to do this, I use a little bit of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is insoluble in water, so if it doesn't react here, it's pretty easy to filter off. With the calcium carbonate added and the stirring turned on, I crank up the heat. The goal now is to heat the solution to about 90 C and to hold it there for 10 minutes. So what we're doing here is separating out the whey proteins. Whey proteins are the proteins that are still dissolved in solution after the casein has been removed. The two major whey proteins in milk are albumins and lactoglobulins. When the solution is heated to boiling, the structure of the proteins are compromised and they become denatured. They're no longer able to dissolve in the water and they precipitate out. When acetic acid and calcium carbonate react, they form CO2 gas, which can cause some foaming here. As the solution heats up, the foaming might get more intense, and it's possible for it to bubble over. In my case, I didn't really have any problems, but it's something to be aware of if you decide to do this yourself. Just keep an eye on it, and have a container sitting around to catch anything if it does end up overflowing. After boiling it for 10 minutes, I take it off the hot plate. I let the beaker sit undisturbed for about 30 seconds, and things quickly settle at the bottom. The solid at the bottom is a mixture of unreacted calcium carbonate and precipitated proteins. Now that most of the solids have settled, I move on to filtering. The solution is passed through two coffee filters, which I've put inside a glass funnel. It's a good idea to try to filter off just the liquid portion first, and then to add the solids after. If everything is added all at once, the filter will quickly get clogged and it will just take a long time. Once everything is passed through, I use a little bit of warm distilled water to wash both the beaker and the filter. The filter is then removed and I squish out some of the excess water. This filter paper was then spread out and allowed to dry. It was really hard to see against the white background, but there was actually some white solid that still remained. So to get rid of it, I just quickly filtered it again. 
The solution that passes through is still a little bit opaque, but there's no white solid. The beaker is then transferred to the hot plate, and I need to boil away a lot of the water. A stir bar is added, and I crank up the temperature on the hot plate. To speed up the evaporation, I also set up a small fan. With this setup, the evaporation was actually pretty quick. When I got down to around 125 milliliters, the solution became opaque. I continued to evaporate the water until the volume was around 40 milliliters. When the stirring's on, some of the liquid is pushed up the sides and we also get some foaming, so the volume reading isn't super accurate. So I turned off the stirring and let things settle to try to get a better reading. Because I was filming this, I tried to do it all in the same shot, but I really should have taken the beaker off the hot plate. It bumped pretty violently and shot a small amount out of the beaker. It actually kind of scared me when it happened, and I quickly turned the stirring back on. In the beaker, I now have a concentrated mixture of lactose and minerals, and I need to separate them. To do this, I add 150 milliliters of 95% ethanol. This mixture is then brought to a boil, and it's boiled for 5 minutes. The lactose is soluble in this hot ethanol solution, but the minerals aren't, so they should remain undissolved. Like when I filtered off the albumin, I let the beaker stand for something like 30 seconds, and most of the solid sank to the bottom. This hot ethanol solution was then filtered through a couple coffee filters. The beaker and the filter funnel were washed with a little bit of warm ethanol. By the time the filtration is done, the solution below has cooled a little and lactose starts to precipitate out. I get the beaker back on the hot plate and already a lot of lactose has fallen out of solution. Anyway, I turn on the stirring and the heating, and with the help of the fan, I evaporate the ethanol down to around 70 milliliters. By the time I get to 70 milliliters, a whole bunch of lactose has precipitated. The beaker is removed from the hot plate and put somewhere to cool down. It's covered with some plastic wrap to prevent the hot ethanol from evaporating. Once it cooled to room temperature, I put it in a fridge for about a week. Lactose is really not soluble in ethanol, but the crystallization can be pretty slow. In the meantime, I went and got the casein from earlier, and I added it to a blender. I also added about 200 milliliters of distilled water. I put on the lid, and then I blended it for about 30 seconds on a low setting. The goal here is to break up the casein and to just give it a good washing. Once I felt like I had mulched it up enough, I moved on to filtering it. Everything was transferred to the filter, and the blender was washed with a small amount of distilled water. Once all the water had passed through, I was left with this goopy stuff. To further wash the casein and to dry it up, I added some 99% isopropyl alcohol. Once everything had passed through, I washed it again with the alcohol. Then, once all of this alcohol had filtered through, the casein was transferred somewhere to dry. A few days later, all of the filter papers were very dry. The solid from each was then scraped off and weighed. About four days later, the lactose ethanol mixture was removed from the fridge and filtered off. Everything was transferred to the filter and the beaker was washed with a little bit of cold ethanol. Once everything had passed through, I add a bit more cold ethanol to wash the lactose. The filter is then removed, and the lactose is allowed to dry. Over the course of a day, the ethanol evaporated, and I was left with a nice fluffy powder. The lactose was weighed and added to a piece of paper, and this was grouped with the other solids that I collected. The number at the top left corner of each paper just represents the order that they were isolated in. With everything isolated, I can compare my results with the average composition of skim cow milk. Casein is associated with a lot of lactose and minerals, so it makes sense that the mass I recovered is higher than expected. 
The ratio of casein to whey protein in cow's milk is about 80 to 20, but what I got was closer to a 70-30 split. The mass of the whey protein is buffed up a little bit due to unreacted calcium carbonate. The lactose that was recovered was about 2.6 grams less than expected. I imagine that most was lost in the casein, and some probably stayed dissolved in the ethanol. The minerals were also less than expected, but again, most of the missing stuff is probably stuck in the casein. Just for fun, I tried to remake the milk from the powders that I got. I wanted to make 100 milliliters, so I put in about half of everything that I recovered. It was quite chunky and would definitely have a hard time dissolving, so I quickly put it through a coffee grinder. I transferred it back to the beaker, and then I added 100 milliliters of warm water. I stirred it around for a few minutes, but no matter what, I couldn't get everything to dissolve. Milk is a careful balance of proteins interacting with minerals and sugars to get everything suspended or dissolved. All of my proteins are denatured, so the casein's not going to go back into suspension and the albumin is not going to dissolve. The difference between what I have here and powdered milk is that in powdered milk, the proteins are still functional. In either case, just for fun, I tried to taste the milk to see what it was like, and it tasted horrible. It was especially horrible because some of the bittering agent used in the ethanol was passed on to the lactose. Anyway, that's about it. I hope this video was able to teach you guys a little bit about milk. So before I let you guys go, I just want to mention one last thing. A good friend of mine is part of a new nonprofit organization here in Montreal that's called Project Pinpoint. Project Pinpoint is a community initiative working to raise funds which will be used to promote safety and security of Quebec youth. The goal is to raise $15,000 through fundraising and various other community events. All proceeds will be donated directly to the Montreal-based Missing Children's Network. I think this is a really good cause. I've already donated $100, and I'm going to be involved in a few of the events. So if you guys have time, you should check out their website at projectpinpoint.ca, or drop a like on their Facebook page. Links to everything will be in the description. So as usual, I'd like to thank everyone who's supporting me on Patreon. Everyone who supports me will see my videos 24 hours before I release them to YouTube. On top of this, all of my supporters can directly message me on Patreon with any questions or comments that they have. And I do my best to respond within about a day or so to all of my Patreon messages. If you support me with $5 or more, you'll get your name at the end of the video like you see here.